So thank you all. Great, great to have you with us on the panel. As we start the conversation, one quick starter. A question around this common future. We are here talking about delivering on a common future, but for, you know, perhaps the first question is, do we all have a common vision for this common future? And I wanna tap into each of your thoughts on that. When you think of what this common future should be, paint a picture for us. What do you see? His Excellency, let me start with you, please. We may not take it for granted that uh, it is that way, but we can work at it and make sure that it is the way we want it. First, to make it common to all of us, that that is the understanding. But what is to be taken for granted is that there is a future for us. So I think it is always going to be work in progress that uh, people will keep harmonizing their different views about what we think, what we have to do, looking at the future and, and what we want for, to see in, in that future. So I think there is already the understanding that we have to work for a common future. Uh, so we have to work uh, uh, at that and make sure that we, we get it. So I think it's it's work in progress. We are moving towards the point, and uh, I am optimistic that uh, the world has a lot of divergences, but at the same time, on everyone's mind and every nation's uh, uh, vision, there is thinking of that common future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you believe there's a common understanding. Mm -hmm. Let me let me jump to Amali on this one now. Thanks. Thank what you. do you see? Thank you very much. Um, I think the, the, the biggest common point, I think, for all of us is that we have a planet to live on in 100 years' time, and that all of us who are living here can do so with access to healthcare and to education, um, that we can be thriving in our countries, that we can be looking after our natural resources and managing that effectively, whilst driving the growth and prosperity of our countries as well. Um, this is not an easy challenge, um, but you know I'm 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 enthusiastic about it. You know I think we see some incredible work being done, and I'm I must admit I'm blown away. My first visit to Rwanda, you have an amazing country, President, um, and I think you know the, for me coming here and having us all together to be able to share our knowledge, share our resources, to help each other to solve these big challenges. That's the common future uh, as I see it. Um, and certainly I'm feeling very bullish um, that I think we are heading in better directions with that. Thank you for that. Makta Diop, from your view, what do you see? I'm seeing a world which is uh, full of uncertainty, but I think that uncertainty can be transformed in certainty. And uh, to do that, we need to structurally transform what is happening on the continent. Uh, all these uncertainties coming from crisis which is multiform food, health, slow down, disturbance in the value uh, supply chain. But what we have seen here in Rwanda in response to the COVID-19 crisis is a good example of what I'm telling in terms of structural transformation, which requires for me three things, ambition, vision, and implementation capacity. When the crisis started and the world was talking about vaccine crisis and inequity, this country sees that opportunity sees that moment to say, let's do things differently and structurally. And this is a good illustration of what I think that needs to be done and the vision I have for the continent. A, a, a vision where the continent will take this uncertainty, transform it in uncertainty, and to do that, we have all the instruments, and one of them is Africa Trade uh, 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 Agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Adesina, your view. Well, thank you. Uh, first, let me thank His Excellency President Paul Kagame for inviting us here. So I have an opportunity to thank you and also to thank my dear sister, uh, Secretary General Patricia Scotland for this fantastic meeting. I think when one talks about 
common future. President Kagame said it already. And I think also um, what, uh, what just said by Mokta, when you enter Kigali, it's different every single time you enter it. The last time I came to see the president was three years ago. And I couldn't even recognize Kigali when I got here. So when we talk about a common future, a common future needs good leadership mm -hmm. to shape that future. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have here. And I also think that kind of common future is what Patricia Scotland just very well explained to us here just this morning. The second thing I want to say is just listen to the Secretary General, just as what she was talking. You were saying that the size of the economy of the Commonwealth will grow, it's about 13 trillion dollars. Now, but the issue is, it's concentrated though. Five countries are the ones that actually control most of those. That's in, that is UK, that is um, Australia, Canada, maybe Nigeria, and India. So that common future must be exactly what President Kagame said, common wealth. It must be well shared all across. The second one is also <laughs> that the common future must be the future of the youth. And when I was just watching up there, and you said 60% of the population of the Commonwealth is less than the age of 29. So the future is here. So we got to make sure that we build the Commonwealth for the youth. It's 73 years old, but it's actually a very young Commonwealth. And the last point I wanted to make on the common future is what Malice said. We cannot have a common future without a common planet. So we have to have climate resilience, we have to make sure that, as also President Kagame and also Mokta was saying, that we also have vaccines. Today we are here, we are doing well because we have vaccines, but it's an inequitable access to vaccines. Only 16% of Africa has access to vaccines. So we cannot have that common future in which we all live unless we have equitable access to vaccines. Thank you so much. And, and there's a lot of ongoing work on the continent in that regard as well right now. Um, Dr. Forrest, let me come to you. What do you see? What's a common future for you? Well, I'm, I have to admit to being really excited about the vision that I see for the Commonwealth. Um, and it's kind of encapsulated, I think, in my relationship with President Kagame. We had dinner together in my home not long after you became president at, at your first Chogham, I think. And just to see the growth across the Commonwealth, but in particular in relation to human values, human rights, where we have to start is equal education outcomes, not targets, equal education outcomes for girls and boys. And of course, that removes any possibility of having forced marriage or childhood marriage or any form of modern slavery. We're not gonna get there with those things which are dragging the economies down. But how to build the economies up? Well, I think the greatest way to build the economies up is just to come swinging back to vaccinations. We have to remove the fear of disease. That is for certain we need to really prolifically invest vaccinations into Africa. But even more prolifically and even more certain and more permanently, we've got to invest in our children, we have to invest in girls and boys, equal education outcomes, and how then do we create this level playing field between developing nations, between African nations, Commonwealth nations, and the rest of the world? Well, it isn't through just continuously backing dirty fuels, continuously backing hyper expensive, the more you use it, the more expensive they become, fossil fuels. We have new technology breaking across the world. We have a huge new possibility for every member of the Commonwealth, particularly here in Africa, of very inexpensive. The more you use it, the cheaper it becomes. The more you use it, the more abundant it becomes. And that's renewable energy. Green electrons from electricity, green molecules like fossil fuel, but this time they don't destroy the environment. You can transport them everywhere. A transportable energy future like coal, oil or gas, but 
it's fully green, no harm, and the more you use it, the cheaper it becomes. Here in Africa, the Renewable Energy Agency of the world says you have a thousand times more renewable energy than you're ever gonna need by 2040. Let's capture that for the kids. Let's capture that for the economy, and let's capture that for equality. Thank you, wow. That's an incredible statistic. Uh, let me come back to you now, President Kagame, and when you look at the role of the Commonwealth on delivering on this common future, and I think we've mentioned the importance of leadership, the importance of, so at, you know, national level, country level, you know, talk us through the role of the Commonwealth and what we need to do better, what we need to lean into. Yeah, with the Commonwealth, um, we already have many things in common, indeed be it the language, be it uh, the different systems, uh, financial systems that would enable us to make investments, uh, trade with each other, uh, all together. So there is a starting point that is more or less, I would say, good enough, but we need to make it better. We need to keep making sure that the Commonwealth, when we talk about the Commonwealth, we actually mean the Commonwealth, not uh, just that being common to a few of the many 54 countries. So, and, and this is why I said it keeps being a work in progress. We keep having to engage one another, finding out what we can do uh, to bring that balance to the extent that uh, everyone in the Commonwealth, the family of nations, uh, feels they are part of it. Right. Uh, no one is left behind. I think this is what we have to, to, to focus on. Um, so that, um, you know, even those at the lower level, this that was said earlier, the small developing uh, nations feel they're not left behind. We uplift everyone and, and move towards that and fulfill that obligation to the commonness that we uh, aspire to in this family of nations. So, whether it is trade, it's, uh, trade and business, investments, different things. When other issues were talked about, health, you know, we had this pandemic, we had uh, a shortage of uh, vaccines. At times, vaccines were there for uh, fewer countries than, uh, you know, the many that were left without for quite a long time. But at a certain point, of course, uh, we were able now to see that uh, flow to, to the people who were lacking uh, in that. But, but the pace at which things move uh, needs to be increased uh, and so that we give more value to the Commonwealth and the feelings uh, of the people of the Commonwealth. Okay, so the pace is really important then. Let's go ahead. And I think referencing also, I, so well put by uh, the Secretary General, Patricia Scotland earlier, you know, how to put the common back into the wealth, ensuring inclusion, ensuring a feeling of belonging and value for the small as well as the bigger uh, members of the Commonwealth. And uh, th thank you for that. Let me come to you now. As Managing Director of the IFC, Magdar, what kind of mechanisms for finance do we require in place to really deliver on this vision? No, thank, you very, thank you very much, Julie. I would like just to, to rebound of what President Kagame just said. I think that when talking about a Commonwealth is a mold in common, and uh, he's been challenging all of us to be moving faster and to do our share, which is quite essential if we want to build this world in common. Uh, let's take the case of vaccine. When the challenge came, President Kagame, with his vision and his, his leadership, uh, brought the country to 
hopefully being able to produce very soon vaccine. What is the share responsibility and commonality? Is the rest of the world now needs to buy this vaccine? Rwanda has done what it has to do, is to do the first step to use its resources to mobilize people, to organize that. But if the world doesn't come and buy this vaccine, we don't see that communality arriving. And that's where I see the transformation of the continent. Let's take another example. We heard that uh, Rwanda is producing EVs. We're talking about climate change. They, this is their contribution, one of the contribution to the fight against climate change. But if the rest of the world doesn't buy the EVs produced here in Rwanda, and only buy it in countries we used to buy it, we will not have that share uh, wealth that we are talking about. Let me take a third example, which is the food crisis. The continent has a potential to produce and to have a resilient uh, value chain in food production. We have a lot to do in Africa, and President Kagame is challenging us every day to do more, and he's doing more for his own country to build resilient value chain in Africa, and the potential is here. My brother, Akin, has been advocating it all, all his career because it's his specialty. But if we don't have also a trading mechanism which allow African countries to, to export those, those products which has been transformed here, where the value addition has been increased here, we'll not be able to reach that. So this is a challenge of the communality of this wealth that we are talking about. So how to reach there? First, as I said, is ambition, not to have a ceiling and say, this is not possible in the continent. The second one is to have the vision on how to do it. The third one is implementation. And President Kagame, every time I meet with you, Ex Excellency, you go back to me and say, implementation, implementation, and implementation. We have now some tools. In IFC, for instance, what we are doing more and more, we'll be financing. Uh, of a special facility for SMEs in Africa, and we'll be financing trade, fin trade financing. As been mentioned earlier, trade financing will be the essential part of being, building a resilient ecosystem and value chain in Africa. So we need to dedicate particular and specific resources to help intra-Africa trade. So these are some of the elements that I think will be uh, uh, helping moving forward. And lastly, de-risking investment. We have a lot of businessmen here who don't know the continent as we know it, and we would like to put their money in the, in the economy, but ask us to de-risk it. So we'll be bringing our resources to de-risk it and, and, and to be able to attract more investment. So we have a very full agenda before us, and we are very glad and lucky to have President Kagame to, to guide us in that process. Thank you. Thank you for that very, very clear ambition, the vision to get their implementation apps absolutely critical. And as we've been talking about vaccines, maybe just important to say that Africa's response to COVID-19 through, you know, empowering the Africa CDC has been a really critical factor as well in driving, um, you know, the ability now for this bold ambition around vaccine manufacturing and even delivery of vaccines. And this has been a partnership effort between heads of state. As a foundation, we were honored to partner with the Africa CDC on the saving lives and livelihoods partnership and what I'd like us all to sit and think is as we talk about this whatever sector you're from what's your role in plugging in and how do we best work together and partner to really move things along so uh, Amali let me come to you next and let's just take a look at um, you know, the role of technology and innovation in addressing today's most pressing issues is really, really important. And I know you are very passionate about sustainable growth and combating climate change. So talk us through what you see. Where do we need to step up? What needs to be done? I mean, te technology is amazing, isn't it? I mean, we, we have gone through, and I was chatting to some other guests on the way here and saying, you know, what a different COVID we would have had maybe 15, 20 years ago if technology wasn't in the place, you know, the ability for us to continue. Each of us here today, we carry around supercomputers in our pockets. You know, we have wristwatches which probably have more compute powers than we use sending people to the moon. You know, so technology is now fiber. This is what connects us as people, as populations. Um, my company, Subak, we were set up during COVID. 
I have uh, our office in Australia. I've never met these people. Everything was done remotely. When I hear things about how we can set up businesses in Rwanda in, what was it, six, six minutes, was it, or, some, or something like that? Six hours, six hours. Six minutes is the next goal, Claire, maybe. Claire, Sorry, Claire, Claire giving you big jobs here. the new challenge. Um, <laughs> But this is incredible, right? I mean, this is, this is, this is what technology allows us to do. Um, and, you know, Subak is, we're named after the Indonesian Water Cooperative, and the way that we see it is to say, look, uh, data is our water, right? This is what feeds us. Information is what helps us to grow. And I think the ability of technology to connect us across all of our regions, for us to learn from each other, um, is so critical. Um, you know, we, we, we launched our uh, data catalog. So everyone here, if you are interested in climate data, data.subac.org, you can go and access this. So for everyone who is solving problems, what we basically say is, look, whatever your system, whatever you're trying to do, whoever you are, private company, public company, NGO, individual, let's help you find this information and use the technology. Um, and, you know, it's fantastic to see how startups, how young people are using this. Uh, so we recently signed our first Rwandan fellow, our research fellow, an incredible young man, Ghislaine, who is looking at um, EV uh, vehicles and creating dashboards to optimize that. We have companies who are looking at satellite data of the Congo Basin to look at where illegal logging and roads are taking place. So these is what technology allows us to do to solve these big problems at speed collaboratively. Um, and I think, you know, for all of us here, you know, to take that opportunity to nurture that, um, and I must admit, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my first uh, visit to Rwanda. I am very much hoping it won't be my last because I'm so excited by what you are doing here. Um, and uh, I think if I can have a few conversations, I'm meeting with your, uh, your director of your Kigali uh, Innovation City later, um, but I would love to bring Sabak here. We are launching a fundraise and I would love to make uh, Rwanda our, our, our uh, continental hub actually for climate data. Wonderful. Andrew, let me come to you. I think you painted such a vivid picture when, when, when you were looking forward for us and uh, just want to tap more into this idea of access to just inclusive and equitable energy transition. How do we achieve this? Because that's, that's, that's the whole challenge, right? So what's that journey and what role can different stakeholders play? Yeah, let's just go to His Excellency's magic words, which have been repeated my, by my brothers in development. Uh, implementation. Now, everyone can have great ideas, great plans. Uh, there's projects which have been in Africa which haven't been developed for decades. Um, but I believe their time has come. You know, when, when we think of Africa as a huge green energy superpower which first has supplied all the electrons to keep these lights on to allow kids to do their homework at night, which is bereft to many, um, that we can in fact dramatically accelerate cheap energy to all the homes throughout Africa with very cheap electrons because we now have green energy. Then we have to think what is stopping the implementation of that? If, if that can create the equity we need to make sure little girls have the same education outcomes, therefore the same opportunities as boys, then what's getting in the road of that? Well, I can only give you, Your Excellency, and all of you, my own personal lived experience. There's a lot of talk out there in the Western world about the trillions of dollars of capital which can be made available to developing nations, to African nations, to the Commonwealth, but it doesn't actually appear. It's more like fake friends. And the stumbling block here for my real friends on this stage and in this audience is that while the capital is there and the projects are there and there's great managers like my own team and many other teams around the world who can implement these projects, we can take construction risk we can take execution risk, we can take finance risk, we can take marketing risk, long-term risk, short-term risk, but what we can't take is sovereign risk. And who's best to provide sovereign risk? Sovereigns. And you've got these spectacular 
multilaterals here on this stage, which could manage this like that if we can get Western nations to step up and say, okay, you don't want money from us, that's fine. You can get it from the capital markets. It's free, fair, competitive markets. And it's abundant. There is no shortage of capital. It's the allocation of capital to give the implementation the president asked for across his nation, across all Commonwealth nations. We removed that sovereign risk, which is simply expropriation mm -hmm. or egregious, or that means very unfair tax changes. Remove that risk through insurance and these multilaterals who are amongst the best in financial history, not best in the world, best in financial history at getting developing nations going, they can muster that insurance. We can finance from across the world from those trillions of dollars and then we can implement President Kagame's dreams. That's real talk. Thank you. Thank you for cutting to the bones of it. Um, let me come to you now, uh, Akin, and just asking, you know, when we look at youth and women and we're sitting on the continent with the fastest growing youth population in the world. We've recognized that 60% of uh, people in the Commonwealth are young people. Um, so what is our role and how do we go about enabling and empowering young people and women? Uh, thanks, thanks very much. You know, the first is that to be able to support young people, um, we all, in all of what we do, we have to prioritize young people in all of our financing. Mm. Because I think that for Africa and, and for all of the Commonwealth countries, the real issue is we have to create youth-based wealth. You know, if you have a demographic that is actually aging in some places and a lot more in terms of young people, what they actually need is access mm. to skills, to education, to finance, it's very, very critical that we do that. Now, let me give some concrete examples about how we are doing this at the African Development Bank. You know, we've put the issue of jobs for youth in Africa at the center of what we do. Before I was elected, when I was elected president of the bank, seven days before I took my job, I went to, what is that place in your country? Gore, Gore, Gore Island, Mr. President. I went over there and I stood in this door, which you call the door of no return. And that's where they took all the slaves out. And I asked myself when I go back into my car, this is where they took all of our talents, our strong people, our, you know, everybody out. But then I got into my car and I started thinking, today, those people left, they were taken against their volition. Today, we have young people on their own volition. They get on rickety boats and they head to the Mediterranean, heading to Europe. So let me be very clear, Secretary General, I don't believe that the future of Africa's youth lies in Europe. I don't believe it lies in Latin America or Asia or anywhere else. It lies in Africa growing well, able to create quality, decent, competitive jobs for its young people. And I'll give you com concrete examples. For example, right here in Rwanda, we started a program called Coding, I mean, just also like Mali was saying, Coding for Employment. At the bank, this work is to prepare the youth for the digital future that the Secretary General was talking about. We, we established about 130 centers of excellence that will have about 234 young people, 1,000 people that are coders. Right here in Rwanda, Mr. President, we have with you the Kigali Coding Academy, Rwanda Coding Academy, which is to develop world-class people in software engineering. In Nigeria, we have folks from Nigeria here. We have an iDice program in digital and creative industries. We invest in $170 million there with Islamic Development Bank with also our Johnson Center to develop more to help to create about 6.1 million jobs, right? So I think we have to upskill the, the, the youth for the jobs of the future. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, I cannot say this without talking of agriculture. You know, agriculture is the coolest jobs in the world. Um, and, I, and I hope that our young people will realize that. 
because the size of the food and ag business in Africa by 2030 is going to be worth a whopping $1 trillion. So if you're trying to be a billionaire, it's not going to come from oil and gas. It's not, nobody drinks oil, nobody smokes gas, everybody eats food. And so we got to be into agriculture as a business. The third thing that I want to say is finally about how we finance young people. You know, he was just saying, Fortes was talking about how we finance the issue of climate and, and, and energy transition. But today you look at Africa, our financial institutions are not set up for young people. We have missing financial institutions, we have actually missing markets to serve them. We have a population, young people, Julie, 455 million people, is going to rise to 845 million by 2050. So we have to create new financial ecosystems around young people. And that's why at the African Development Bank, we took the decision that we are going to now create what is called Youth Entrepreneurship Investment Banks. There will be new financial institutions. There will be, Mr. President, there will be new financial institutions that will create ecosystems of support around the businesses of young people. Today, you go to a bank, you're trying to get money. They ask you, how old are you? You say, 21 years old. They said, go and bring your tax receipts for the last 40 years. What does that really mean? So, but these youth entrepreneurship investment banks will finance the businesses of young people in a life cycle model throughout as you use different instruments from technical assistance to debt to equity financing to grow their businesses. The point I'm trying to make is this. The future that we were talking about at the beginning of this panel for it to happen, we have to create new financial institutions that can create youth-based wealth. And that is what we are focusing on. And those institutions, by the way, we're designing them now. They'll be ready by the end of this month. Excellent. Excellent. Really, really great to hear that. We've come really to our final question. I want to pose the same question to all of the panelists and just, you know, uh, fully aligned with this approach focusing on young people and women. And at the MasterCard Foundation, our Young Africa Work Strategy is focused on delivering you know, 30 million young people with work opportunities. Dignified and fulfilling work is our focus. So we are walking this journey together, all of us, doing our respective things. And so as we close this panel, my question is, what is the promise that we must make to young people in the Commonwealth? and young people across the globe, I guess, by extension. And Amali, can I begin with you? I think building on my fellow guest here, I think the promise of education, that we will train them to have the skills that they need to fit for the future. You know, whether that is growth in agriculture, whether that's in climate issues and technology in finance, um, if we don't do that, we're doing them a disservice. And that's the one thing that we can do is make sure that they have the skills to actually uh, be successful in the future. Excellent. Thank you so much. Let me come to you. Yeah, I think we just have to create more space for young people um, in, every, in, in every sector, in, any, in, in every area. You know, we always say the future belongs to the young people. I don't believe that. I think the present belongs to them. So we have to start by investing in them today. And, in, you know, and when I look at the, the things that we just have to do is, sometimes I go around, a lot of times I go around, I find people saying, we want to empower the youth. But I've never really seen a young person walk up to me and say, I'm being empowered. So it seems that those that want to empower them are empowering themselves. So the youth don't need empowerment, they need investment. Invest, invest, invest. In them. Wow. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, look, I only completely applaud that. I, I, totally agree. I'd probably come back just another step and say we need to, to educate our little girls and boys to equal standards to become young women executives and, and young male executives so that they can take these business opportunities which are out there. And the great notion that I see is a huge future of, of inexpensive energy which will keep Africa green which will keep agriculture growing to the multi-trillion dollar opportunities it can be, and not the fuels we currently worship and we currently are, seem to be aligned and stuck to, and that's fossil fuels which, left unchecked, will destroy the future of every young person in Africa, 
turn Africa into deserts. That is a future which we can scientifically see. It's not contentious science. It is there for you to see. We need to say, okay, let's adopt these fantastic principles, but let's now bring in the era of totally clean, only green, inexpensive energy so that all the young people can rise and go into that future which my friend is speaking of. I want to make sure those foundations are there so that you as great bankers, great financiers can lend to these young people and you, Mr. President, can ensure that a quality of opportunity which is led through cheap green energy, equal education outcomes is there for every developing nation. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Magda, let me come to you next. Just uh, let them talk. And not talk on their behalf. That's my vision. Uh, youth, like uh, small nations, are often in the world arena talked about and talked for. And I think that what I would like is to see more and more young people being here and talking to us and telling us what they think and for us to respond to their needs. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mr. President, you have the final word. What is your promise to young people? Well, before I come to that, let me say, uh, we all feel very optimistic. And the grounds on which we base the optimism is that all of us, as we are here on the panel and the audience, we seem to very well understand what we need to do. We must do it. And so that some of the things we are saying don't remain just as slogans and things like that we need to. And second, the young people are talking about and have talked about so many times in all sorts of ways, and we know there are millions and millions of them out there. We also need to be thinking of what we do more with them mm -hmm. than for them. Because, because they, they really know what to do as well. All they need are these inputs, which many people mentioned here. Uh, it's about access to different things they don't have access to. Mm. And at the same time, we also need to get them involved. There are certain decisions that have to be made at different levels, and the more they get involved in these decision-making processes, uh, the better. I think we get the best outcomes. And then, uh, I, I think once they have a voice, once they make a contribution to what happens to them, to what happens to all of us, and uh, we should also be integrating. It's not just about the young people. It's about all of us. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have to make sure that we look at the society as, as a complete mm -hmm. thing and then allow the different players to do their part. I think that's what I would say. Thank you very, very, very much. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, two days ago at the youth, uh, the Commonwealth Youth Forum, a young lady stood up and said, you know, we don't want to talk anymore about, you know, uh, with us, for us. We want to talk about with us all the time. We want to be in the rooms, not just about when it's about young people, we want to be in the rooms when it's about every issue. And, uh, and, and that kind of transformation in our approach to young people makes them a huge asset for our future, the common future that we're looking to head to. So please, ladies and gentlemen, a huge warm round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very, very much. And you may take your seats. Thank you, thank you.